Yeah, this doesn't seem right. Today we are going to be looking at the kit of a British infantryman on service in Mesopotamia during the First World War. Before we do that though, this video is part of Beyond the Western Front, a great collaboration between myself and six other channels, where we're looking at the Great War outside of Western Europe. So when you're done watching this video, be sure to check out the other videos in the series, the playlist is linked down below. So anyway, why were the British in Mesopotamia? Well, like all good wars, they were there for the oil. In 1908, after years of unsuccessful prospecting, oil was finally struck by the Burma Oil Company in Persia. And the following year, its subsidiary, the Anglo-Persian Oil Company, the predecessor of British Petroleum, landed quite a significant customer, none other than the Royal Navy. The Royal Navy was seeking to modernize its fleet with oil-fired ships. Oil presented numerous advantages over coal, as it was more energy dense and could fill fuel bunkers more efficiently due to it being a liquid. This would allow their ships to steam further without any alterations to bunker capacity. So when the Ottoman Empire decided to join the Central Powers in October of 1914, these vital interests were suddenly at risk. So the following month, an invasion by Indian Expeditionary Force D was dispatched to protect the oil fields, refineries, and other interests in the region. Now to help set the geography and visualize the campaign, this here is where the Mesopotamia campaign took place, here in what is present-day Iraq. And right over here is Persia, modern-day Iran, and this is where petroleum production was taking place during the First World War. In the middle of the Shat al-Arab was the Abadan refinery, which was of major strategic importance. Back in the day, the APOC refinery there had a capacity of 2,500 barrels a day. Interestingly enough, Abaddon is still the site of a major refinery, now with a capacity of over 400,000 barrels a day. I guess good things never change. The initial invasion force of the army and marines would land some 600 men on the 6th of November to take the fort at Fa, which lay near where the Shat al-Arab and Persian Gulf meet. From there, the rest of the 6th Puna Division would advance onto Basra, capturing it on the evening of the 21st. On the 6th of December, Gurna, which lies on the confluence of the Euphrates and Tigris rivers, was also taken. The success of these actions and others in early 1915, such as the Battle of Shaiba in April, effectively meant that petroleum production in the region would be safe from any Ottoman attack with defense in depth. From this point forward, the mission in Mesopotamia began to creep past its initial goals of securing the oil facilities in the vicinity of the Persian Gulf. And Baghdad began to lure the British in. Since we now kind of have an idea of why the British ended up in Mesopotamia, I'm going to segue and take a little bit of a closer look at the men and the kit of the campaign. If you're interested in the greater campaign, please be sure to check out Rifleman Moore's video on this very topic. It's just before mine in the playlist, so be sure to check that out. So what was it like for the soldiers? For the men who served in the campaign, the conditions were particularly grueling. They could be unappealing at best and horrific at worst. Daytime temperatures during the summer would soar to over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. When the rains would arrive, the banks of the rivers would overflow, though the rains did have the added advantage of keeping the dust down. But because of these river systems, men could find themselves trudging through the knee-deep water of wide rivers. Gurna, a place thrown about as the place of the Garden of Eden, certainly didn't live up to its godly description in Genesis. One British soldier's sentiment was quite clear. It would not take the biblical flaming angel to keep him out of Eden. With sweltering desert heat and flooding riverbanks, disease from varmint and mosquitoes became a significant cause of death and a large drain on manpower, particularly as British and Indian forces advanced deeper into Mesopotamia in 1916 and logistical trains became stretched. In some instances, men could wait nearly two weeks before arriving at a hospital in Basra. In short, it was quite a slog fighting on the deserts and river plains in Mesopotamia. It presented its own fair set of challenges for the men who had to fight there. As for the kit, what I'm wearing is pretty typical of a British soldier of an infantry regiment whilst on service in Mesopotamia in about 1917. Currently, it's in the guise of the 7th Service Battalion of the North Staffordshire Regiment. The big distinguishing factor being the black diamond flash here on my sun helmet. Though, aside from that, 
every British regiment would have appeared nearly identical during the Mesopotamia campaign. So a brief history of the 7th North Staffords, they were raised on outbreak in 1914, and by August of 1915, they were landed at Gallipoli with the rest of the 13th Western Division. Quite a speedy turnaround time, I should say. Trained, equipped, and in the field in just under a year. Their divisional commander from 1915 to 1916, Major General Sir Stanley Maud, would be the last man off the beach during the evacuation of Suvla Bay. He would take Baghdad in 1917. Slightly before him off the beach was a captain of the South Lanx. His name happened to be, you know, Clement Attlee. Anyway, I digress. The whole division then went to Egypt and was refit before being dispatched to Mesopotamia in mid-1916. Interestingly enough, the 13th Division would be the only all-British division to serve in Mesopotamia. All others would combine British and Indian forces. The division would be present when Baghdad was finally taken in March of 1917. The 39th Brigade, that the North Staffords were a part of, would be transferred to North Persia Force in the summer of 1918. But that's a story for another day. The division would see itself demobilized in 1919, less a few battalions to join the Army of Occupation. Anyhow, the kit. So for a British infantryman in Mesopotamia, you would most commonly see him topped with a Wosley Sun Helmet. The Wosley first saw use by British officers in the late 1890s, and by the First World War had basically completely supplanted the colonial pattern foreign service helmet that you see in movies like Zulu. Compared to the colonial pattern helmet, the Wosley offers significantly more sun protection to the face, ears, and nape of the neck due to its larger rim. Wrapped around the top of the helmet is something called a puggery, and regiments would generally have their own different kind of puggery. But the big distinguishing factor on helmets would be the helmet flash. And there are many different designs of flashes used on helmets. And when you're looking at historical photographs, that is actually a really good way to figure out what a regiment is, is by looking at the helmet flash. Kind of a similar idea to a cap badge. Though you sometimes also do see cap badges being used on the front of the helmets as well, though that's not as common. So that is the Wosley Sun Helmet, arguably one of the most iconic pieces of a British infantryman's kit in tropical regions in the early 20th century. And the Wosley would go on to soldier up until the Second World War. Next up on a man's kit, we have the Greyback Shirt. The Greyback Shirt being the standard British Army shirt of the period. Oftentimes, in places such as Mesopotamia, we see them taking off their khaki drill tunics or serge tunics in favor of just wearing their shirt and then rolling up the sleeves as you see here. But if you're wondering what a khaki drill tunic looks like, it looks something like this. Again, relatively iconic to the early 20th century period. But wearing just a shirt with rolled up sleeves became very popular and in the interwar period, we see actual dedicated made khaki drill shirts for men, kind of taking styles of a shirt and of a khaki drill tunic. And by the late interwar period, khaki drill tunics are very much just for ceremonial wear in tropical stations. And incidentally, those khaki drill tunics are where the men's shoulder titles would actually be present. There's actually no real place for them on this uniform. So again, the big distinguishing factor being his helmet flash. And then down from there, we have the man's shorts. Shorts in this period generally started off as khaki drill pants. Trousers is probably a more appropriate name to be using in a video such as this. Sorry about that. And then being cut down into shorts as shorts are significantly more practical, comfortable, whatever you might want to call it in tropical regions. And again, in the interwar period, we see different patterns of dedicated made shorts popping up. Though we find that in Burma in the Second World War, shorts are actually not that great for mosquito control on men's legs. But when you're in the desert or on a garrison, it works just fine. Shorts are probably one of, again, the more iconic bits of British kit in this period. You don't see a whole lot of shorts being used in other nations' armies. A little bit uniquely British, at least from an American point of view. And then down from the man's shorts, we have his putties. Now, in this period, there are two different ways to actually wear your putties. There are the way that I have, which is putty comes all the way up to your knee. And there's also the other way where you have putty comes up to about your knee, but then the top of your stocking folds over the top. And you see both in period photographs. 
I've opted to wear them in this fashion because putties are just so long and otherwise I just have all this excess putty to wrap if I try to do the stocking over the top method. But both are okay, so it's kind of cool. Not completely uniform as you might think. And then below that are the B5 boots, the standard British boot from 1915 onwards. Not sure what you want to hear about boots as boots are kind of standard, but anyway, the bottom of the boots look like that. They are heel plated and hobnailed which is pretty good on leather shoes, helps them wear a little bit better. As for the man's equipment, we have the 1908 webbing, which holds his ammunition and basic things he needs during his life of a soldier. He has his ammunition here and all his other necessities in his haversack and in the pack in the back. And it's definitely a comfortable piece of kit. Seems to distribute the weight pretty well. And then from there, we have the man's rifle. In this instance, it's a short magazine Lee Enfield rifle, the standard British rifle of the early 20th century period. This rifle would see service from 1903 to the Second World War, being used in the Far East till the very end of the war. So quite a storied and historic rifle. It has a 10 round magazine uh, that holds 10 rounds of 303. And for this rifle, it would take the 1907 pattern bayonet, quite a long bayonet, mind you, and that looks something like this. Johnny Turk's gonna be quite intimidated when you come over a trench in Mesopotamia with that. For those of you wondering, this rifle happens to be made by Birmingham Small Arms Company and was produced in 1918 and the bayonet that I have fixed here was made in December of 1914, and it was made by JAC. Now, short form videos such as this are great, but they can never go into the full depth. They're merely primers to get one started. I highly recommend one to further their study by building their library with topics that they enjoy. If you're watching this video, I suspect that you're interested in the Mesopotamia campaign of the First World War that or someone just strong armed you into watching the great collab and if that's the case i can't help you there so if you would like to further your reading i highly recommend this book here the british army in mesopotamia 1914 to 1918. this is by far the most comprehensive and well-written book on the topic that i've been able to come across it was written by major paul knight of the territorial army well at least what used to be the territorial army it's now the Army Reserve, the British and their nomenclature changes. Guess, again, some things never change. Anyway, I hope you found some intrinsic value watching this video and you learned a little bit more about an undercovered bit of the Great War. Once again, this has been part of Beyond the Western Front collaboration, so please be sure to check out the other videos in the playlist. In the next one, Lord Rivers of the Ministry of History will be covering the Gallipoli Star and the Ottoman-German Alliance. And I do apologize if there was a little bit of excess sound today. The neighbor has pulled out their sop with lawnmower. And if you liked my video here today, be sure to subscribe so that you can be alerted when more of my content comes down the pipeline. Pun very much intended. And check out my social media links down below so that you can keep abreast of all channel happenings. Some of you asked a few months ago how you could support the channel. Well, there is now a Patreon that you can find below as well though there are no tears or anything like that yet, as I have not figured any of it out. So anyway, thanks for watching, and I look forward to seeing you all in the next video very soon. Toodles, everyone, and keep Johnny Turk on the run. It's the soldiers of the king, my lads, who be my lads, who be my lads, in the fight for England's glory, lads, of its worldwide glory, let us see. And when we say we've always won and